I'd like to read again, just to open in Ephesians chapter 3. And one of the first things that our brother Dan has pointed out to us, and I want to re-emphasize, is that dispensationalism is a biblical word. If I had my way, I'd throw the ism ending off of it, because most isms are highly suspect, in my view. And we're not imposing something on the Bible that's not there. But what we're saying is that this old-fashioned word dispensation, which today we would might, might call a stewardship or an administration, is actually found throughout the Scripture. And in our chapter, Ephesians chapter 3, it's found twice. And I'm not going to expound this section. I didn't check with Brother Ian, but I suspect he may actually be wanting to say some things from this chapter in his message. Sorry, I'm in the wrong book here, Ephesians 3. We're going to begin reading at verse number 1. And I'm reading in the New King James, uh, which will make this a little bit clearer. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship, administration, dispensation of the grace of God. There you go. That's the dispensation that we are living in today that was made known by the apostles and prophets, as we're about to read. It was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand the knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I might preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the dispensation, administration, stewardship of the mystery, now, your King James Version says the fellowship, koinonia, but the original text should be oikonomia, which is our word for dispensation. So that's the second use of it in this chapter. Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now that expression, the eternal purpose, is literally the setting down, prophesis in Greek, the setting down of the ages. Again, emphasizing what Brother Dan has said. God framed the ages. The Lord Jesus Christ made the ages, and he made them in order that they might unfold the manifold wisdom of God. What is being discussed in this chapter, of course, is truth that was not known in the Old Testament, but was revealed especially to Paul and to the apostles and prophets, as he said here, by revelation. And one of the things that our covenant theologian friends tell us, of course, is that the church is in the Old Testament. But here we learn that the church cannot be in the Old Testament because it was unknown until Paul came and through the stewardship, administration, or dispensation that God gave him, he made it known to us in the scriptures. So again, without going into the details of this text, that's not my task today or this morning, uh, I would like to emphasize that this is a very biblical concept that we are teaching. I want to begin, I'll just tell you where I want to go in the next 50 minutes or so. I want to begin talking about the importance of the topic. For some of you, it would be important enough just to realize that the scriptures teach it, but I want to make it as relevant and important as it can possibly be for our age, because it is a very big deal that we get this right. And that's what I want you to be committed to after listening to all that you listen to today. Let's get it right, because this is foundational for the very gospel that we preach. And beyond that, this is the way God has designed the ages to maximize his own glory. And we're interested in that. And so let's make sure we get this right. The primary difference, I would say, between dispensationalism, and we're going to explain these terms in a little more detail, and covenant theology is the emphasis. Dispensationalism's emphasis is the glory of God. God's glory is what is paramount 
in dispensationalism because that is what is paramount in the New Testament scriptures. God is unfolding a plan which he has carefully crafted from eternity whereby the glory of his Son will be manifest, the wonders of his grace will be on display, and man will be blessed, yes, but never central. Whereas, as we're going to learn, the covenant of redemption, which is not a biblical covenant, but a theological covenant drafted by our dear friends of the covenant world, it is anthropocentric. It puts man and man's exaltation in the center. That's the showpiece. And I think we know enough about the scripture to realize that cannot be right. Yes, man will be blessed. And we're thank God, we thank God for that. And we thank God for every bit of truth in covenant theology. There is, of course, some truth in it. Our, our, our conclusions today will be that there is more half-truth than truth. And very often, half-truths are the most dangerous kinds of errors because they shift the emphasis away or they present an unbalanced view of what God is intending to teach us. So let's talk for a little bit about this. The glory of God is the central thing in dispensationalism, and I hope you realize that as we go through the day. Covenant theology is too narrow and it's too anthropocentric, meaning it puts man in the middle. But more than that, dispensationalism is true to the word of God. And one of my topics today is going to be to talk to you about interpreting the scriptures and how a consistent, literal, grammatico, historical, normal way of reading the scriptures will always yield a dispensational understanding. And we're going to try to demonstrate that to you. I hope you're already convinced of it. If not, my task is to shift you in that direction. I'm going to suggest to you, as Dan has already said, that dispensationalism was not invented by John Nelson Darby. Matthew is a dispensationalist. So is Mark. Luke is as well. John is very dispensational. Paul is a dispensationalist. So is Peter. So is James. All of our New Testament writers are dispensationalists. If you want to know a little bit about church history, Clement of Alexandria, who lived, according to my notes, 150 to 222, was clearly a dispensationalist. He described four dispensations. Here's the real shocker to you. Augustine was dispensational. Now, he's often considered to be the granddaddy of covenant theology, but in fact, he was a dispensationalist as well. In fact, we're going to learn that covenant theology didn't come about and wasn't formulated until the 1500s. So talk about something new. That's what's new. To say that John Nelson Darby invented dispensationalism is like saying Martin Luther invented justification by faith. It's ludicrous. What did he do? He rediscovered, he, he brought to the fore an ancient truth that had been suppressed systematically by a, an apostate church and by the devil himself. And to bring back a truth to its full glory is not to invent it. So, Martin Luther didn't invent justification by faith, and John Nelson Darby certainly didn't invent dispensationalism. In fact, I'm going to suggest to you that the progression of the recovery of truth from Martin Luther on actually climaxed in the re-emphasis and the relearning of the truth of dispensationalism. Putting it differently, the very principles, the solas of the Re Reformation, if you don't know what that is, I'll tell you in a moment, those principles are going back to the scripture, sola scriptura, by scripture alone, right? Solus Christus, that means Christ alone. Sola gratia, which means by grace alone. And of course, soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. These are the so-called solas of the Reformation. Those principles of putting the Bible first and of interpreting it normally began with a rediscovery of the truth of salvation, justification by faith. But they progressed. And as men continued to rediscover truth, the climax was in the 1800s when the Philadelphia Church, thinking of the seven churches of Asia and the historical panorama that they present, brought this to its fruition. So anyone who believes Martin Luther was correct in his reading of the scriptures and continues that legacy, that philosophy of interpretation forward, ultimately ends up believing in a pre-tribulation rapture, a local assembly, a young earth, and of course, what we're calling today dispensationalism. 
It's a wonderful thing, as we think about this whole unfolding, that God has taken us into his confidence. You say, why is it that God tells us what's going to happen? Well, remember James tells us that Abraham was the friend of God. And remember there in Genesis, God says, shall I hide from Abraham that thing that I am about to do? I'm not going to hide it from him. He's my friend. I'm going to take him into my confidence. And remember in the upper room, the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, I have called you no longer servants, but I have called you friends. Because we're still his servants. We're his friends. He's taking us into his confidence, and he's giving us insights into the future that the world knows nothing about. It is for us to glorify him. It is, it is of course, to affect the way we live, and that's one of the things we want to get out of this conference is Believing in dispensationalism and the imminent return of Christ in the rapture should radically change the way we live. And we hope that that's true for all of us. Now, these are the things that God wants us to have as his confidants. And so, the natural outcome of the Reformation, what Sardis began, Philadelphia ended and brought to a climax. And unfortunately, we're in a denouement right now. We're in the Laodicean age, and some of this is being filtered and lost, watered down, and denied. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the, well, some historical facts and some current matters that show us the danger of jettisoning, throwing out dispensationalism. Let's begin with a historical figure named Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell lived 1599 to 1658. He was the Lord Protector of England, Scotland, and Ireland. He was called Ironsides. He signed the death warrant of King Charles I. He was a very godly man, a very gentle father, but a ruthless warrior. John Bunyan served in his army. John Milton was his secretary. Imagine that, those great luminaries all together. But there's something wrong with this picture, as we say today, because they were all dressed in battle garb. Uh, not, that, not that, you know, being in the armed services is wrong. That's not my suggestion at all, but you'll find out what I'm, where I'm going with this, okay? So he regarded himself as the Joshua of the present day. And he regarded, apparently, the Irish as the Amalekites. Because in, what, where was it? 1649, the Irish Rebellion. Cromwell and his 12,000 troops went over to Ireland and they began a campaign that is very similar to the Israelite treatment of the doomed cities of Canaan. He ruthlessly slaughtered them. He starved them out. He sold them into slavery. And yet, his men went into battle singing the songs. They went into battle chanting the Westminster, West, Westminster Confession. We're saying, this is a bizarre thing. How could he treat these people as he did and yet be such a spiritual man at the same time? And the problem was he wasn't a dispensationalist. That's his problem. He thought he was living in a dispensation that he's not in. He thought there was such a thing as a holy war. There's no holy wars today. He thought he was serving as God's executioner, as Joshua and his army were God's executioners of the Amorites whose cup was full and it overflowed with iniquity. That was God's doing. That was a holy war. There are no holy words today. So you can see very serious things can happen when you're not a dispensationalist. Let's talk about Martin Luther, my friend. I've already mentioned him. Martin Luther had a wonderful grasp of justification by faith. But Martin's problem was he wasn't a dispensationalist. That's why he never got it right. As I say, we need to get it right. He didn't. And one of the things he never got right was God's view of his beloved chosen people, the Jews. Martin Luther was a flaming anti-Semite. And in some ways, all the anti-Semitism that followed up to the point of the Nazis can trace back to Martin and his friends. Now, you can see why Martin, who loved the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ, would think that those who murdered Christ should be culpable and held accountable. And you can see, perhaps, why he would have a dim view of the Jews if he did not understand God's purpose in his people. Let me tell you some things that Martin Luther wrote on his book, On the Jews and Their Lies. He told all Christians to avoid Jewish synagogues and schools and warn people against them, to refuse to let Jews own houses among Christians, 
for Jewish religious writings to be destroyed, for rabbis to be forbidden to preach, to offer no protection to Jews on highways, for usury to be prohibited and for all silver and gold to be removed, put aside for safekeeping and given back only to Jews who truly convert. And he said, my advice, as I said earlier, is first that their synagogues be burned down and that all who come to toss in sulfur and pitch, it would be good if someone could also throw in some hellfire. That would demonstrate to God our serious resolve and be evidence to all the world that it was in ignorance that we tolerated such houses in which the Jews have reviled God, our dear creator and father, and his sons most shamefully up till now, but that we have now given them their due reward. Now, that's just very offensive to us, especially those of us who love Israel. Now, I'm not up here to tell you that we should rubber stamp and approve everything that the current Israeli government does. What I will tell you is that anti-Semitism is satanic in its origin and its energy and its drive. And any objective person looking at how most of the world views the Middle East conflict and views the Jewish people would understand that there is something irrational about the opposition to Israel. It is irrational because it is driven by the God of this world who hates the Jews and wants to destroy them. And unfortunately, Martin himself was a tool in this enterprise. He should never have had that view of Israel. You can preach against Judaism as a means of salvation, as we would as well, but that doesn't mean you hate the people and want to see them destroyed because God has a future for Israel. God is committed to Israel. He loves them with an everlasting love. We'll find out more about that later. So another reason why you want to be a dispensationalist, all right? Let me bring you up to speed a little bit, too, on some of the covenant theology errors and why it's important for us to be dispensationalists today if we want to preserve the purity of the gospel. You see, because this is what the covenant community thinks. We are nothing more and nothing less than just God's people in this age. As Israel was in the Old Testament, so we are in the New Testament. It's an essential continuity Israel as a nation has been set aside, according to these people, and now the church has been taken up. Israel was a mixed multitude. Well, we're a mixed multitude as well. We have unbelievers among us. It's unfortunate, but it will always be the case. And Israel, they became Jews by their birth, and their family units were all Jewish. Therefore, our family units are all Christian, and our children are Christian by birth. And just as they had a sign of the covenant, which was circumcision, so we too must have a sign of the covenant, which is infant baptism. And as they nurtured their people in the Torah, so we nurture our children, we catechize them and bring them up to confirmation in the church. Now you see the horrendous thing that's happening here. The preacher may preach a pure gospel of salvation, justification by faith in Christ alone, and yet the large reaches of his congregation may be unsaved because they never had a moment of salvation. They were brought up in the covenant. They were baptized as infants. They were confirmed in the church. And they're brought in as a mixed multitude. This is happening everywhere in covenant communities. And it explains a whole lot. You and I know better than that. We know nobody's born in the covenant. Nobody's born a Christian. We're born pagans. All of us. And we need to be saved and have that moment in time when we come to accept Christ. But this is lost when you have this false understanding if you're not a dispensationalist. You ask them, well, where's infant baptism in the scriptures? They say it doesn't need to be in the scriptures. It was assumed. It's an argument from silence, which are usually very weak arguments, right? What do you mean assumed? Again, this whole understanding of how the Bible works. We must have a covenant signed today. And it is not circumcision. According to them, it's pedo-baptism or the baptism of children. Again, if you think that Israel and its ceremonial, sacramental type of worship is just in continuity with what we have today, then if you're not a dispensationalist, what will you do? Well, you want vestments. You want a sacristy in your church. You'll want to have Sabbath keeping. You'll want an altar. You'll replace the pulpit with an altar. You'll go back to the sacerdotalism and the sacramentalism that is so prevalent, obviously, in the Roman church, but is now becoming increasingly in vogue in many Protestant denominations. Because after all, it was good for them, it's good for us. You'll want a choir. You will want instrumental music. 
You'll want a beautiful church building. You'll want all the things that belong to a different dispensation because you're not a dispensationalist and you don't realize that's not God's purpose. We're a heavenly people today. We worship in, in the spirit of God. We worship in the heavenly sanctuary. It's not a physical, outward, external worship we have today, but an inward, heartfelt, spiritual worship. You need to be a dispensationalist or you're going to get that wrong. What else? As you know, there is a large move afoot to change the gospel from something that saves men and women from hell and fits them for heaven to rather making them sons of God or priests, as they like to say, on this earth to redeem the culture and to save the planet. Why do they say that? Because they're not dispensationalists. They don't understand God's program in this age. Now, they, these are our friends, the young, reformed, restless types, the YRRs, right? They are young, although some of them are aging now. They're reformed, and they're restless. They don't like the way the gospel has been preached. What's this pie in the sky heaven? That we don't belong on this earth? That we don't rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic? That we try to rescue people from this world for another world? What about this world? Is it not important that we take care of this world and that we redeem the culture and become a part of it? We believe in orthodoxy, but we're not going to go after orthopraxy. You say, what's orthopraxy? Well, that's good behavior. <laughs> that's good Christian behavior. They, that's not appropriate because if you're going to redeem the culture, you need to be in the culture and act like the culture and appeal to the culture. But we're not supposed to be doing anything to the culture but preaching the gospel to it and saving men and women out of it. This is a fundamental dispensational fact. But if you're not a dispensationalist, you're going to get it wrong. What about our friend Joel Osteen? Or to be even more crass, some of these money-grubbing people on the television that tell you that if you are a good Christian, God will make you rich. And they'll use Old Testament promises of earthly blessing for faithfulness, which apply to an earthly people in a different dispensation. They don't apply to our dispensation. God is not here to make you rich. He's here to make you holy. He's not here to set you up in this world, but to prepare you for heaven. This is a fundamental difference. So I hope by going through some of these things, you realize how far away many people have gotten from what we are as spiritual, heavenly people today, what our task is on earth, and where we are going. Again, dispensationalism gets all of those things right because it's actually what the Bible teaches, and its aim is to glorify God. In the dispensation of the fullness of times, Christ will be exalted. So many of God's plans will come to fruition. If God's only plan is to save the elect, we're going to talk about that in a moment, the covenant of redemption. He'll accomplish that, and that's good for those folks who are benefiting from that. But what about all God's other plans? Well, the dispensation of the fullness of times, we'll see them all come together. Christ is all. He's exalted. The grace of God, which has been serially seen through all of these dispensations, will come to a climax. Creation's order will be restored. People will be blessed through God's mediators, the Jews, but ultimately through his son who is reigning. Satan crushed and imprisoned. All of God's enemies subdued. God's programs all brought to fruition. His program for the Gentiles, his program for the Jews, his program for the church of God. All these things coming together in a wonderful climax for his glory. That's what history is about and that's what dispensationalism teaches. I'm going to shift gears now for the next few minutes and talk to you about hermeneutics. You say hermeneutics? Let me read you, uh, <clears throat> well, I'll just refer to it actually. In Luke chapter 24, we find that the Lord Jesus explained all that was written of him in the law and the Psalms and the prophets. And that word he used is uh, it has a, prefix, a preposition dia on it, but it's ermeneuo in Greek, which is where we get the word hermeneutics from. It's also related to the god Hermes, by the way, Mars, because Hermes was the spokesman, right? He was the man of language. He was the god of communication. 
Another use of hermeneuo in the Greek is in John chapter 1. And this occurs several times in John. It says, Rabbi, which is being interpreted master. Remember that phrase at the end of John 1? So hermeneutics, a big word, but what it simply means is interpretation. It's the proper way to interpret the Bible. And really, it's not that difficult. If the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, or you'll end up with nonsense. Okay. Or here's another one. Let's see if I can pull this one off. If your proof text is a text taken out of context, it's a pretext. All right. You got that? So people misuse the scriptures. They don't read it as normal, plain language. God is a God of communication. He intends to be heard and understood. You understand that the scriptures were not written, particularly the New Testament, in the flowery, scholarly, academic language of the people in universities. They were written in very common Greek for common folks to understand truth that God wants everyone to know. You don't need a decoder ring. You don't need to have the Gnostics come and explain the higher truths to you. You don't have to graduate through some school to be able to read and understand the plain meaning of the Bible. We read it as language. We read it as literature. We read it normally. We take it prima facie, face value, just like we would normally do. And any other approach is subjective and cannot be depended on, obviously. It's the person's own imagination and invention. So we talk, we talk about the historical, grammatical understanding of the scriptures. And what we're going to discover is our friends in the covenant communities, they believe in that too when they're talking about doctrinal truths, say, in the New Testament, or about history in the Old Testament, but they won't accept it for prophecy. They have a double hermeneutic. They have a completely different way of understanding the scripture when they're talking about prophecy than they do about everything else in the Bible. Now, given the fact that 27% of the Bible is prophecy, that's a big hunk of the Bible that is inaccessible to them as long as they continue to be brainwashed by this idea that normal language is not being employed and normal tools of communication and of interpretation don't apply. Let's talk a little bit more about this, all right? When we talk about literal interpretation of the Bible, we mean we are taking the Bible as literature. It doesn't mean we're accepting things only in a concrete, wooden, simplistic way. We understand there is simile in all the rhetorical devices. Simile, metaphor. There's even hyperbole in the Bible at times. I would defend that. You may not agree with me. We'll talk about that later. Apostrophe, synecdoche, metonymy. All these things you learn about in high school rhetoric or college, the Bible uses. So, let's think about an example. Um, I am... The door right? does not mean I'm made out of oak and have hinges. We would never be so simplistic and ridiculous as to say that. That's not what we mean by literal. What we mean is we take the Bible as literature. Yes, there are spiritual truths, but we don't spiritualize it in the way that that is usually used. I'll come back to that word in a moment. We do understand there are symbols, but we also understand those symbols are based on plain facts that are being given to us. Now, some people say they spiritualize the Bible. What they mean by that is they don't accept the literal, the literal understanding of it, but instead they have some special hidden meaning that only they apparently are aware of. I don't want you to use spiritualizing for that exercise. That spiritual is far too valuable of a word to be used to describe that behavior. What is the opposite of spiritual? Well, it could be material, or in the moral universe, it's carnal. The opposite of liter literal is not spiritual. The opposite of literal is anti-literal. That is what covenant theology does with prophecy. They're anti-literal. They're against the plain meaning of the scriptures. It says Israel, they say, no, it doesn't mean Israel. It says a thousand years, they say, no, it doesn't mean a thousand years. It's funny when... 400 years are used in Genesis 15 of God's promise of how long the people would be in the land of Egypt. That's okay. 400 is okay there. But 42 months doesn't mean 42 months. A thousand years doesn't mean a thousand years. How do you know? Because we believe it's all symbolic. And if you come along with us, we'll train you and you'll be able to think just like we do. 
Well, we don't want special training. We want to be able to understand through the Spirit of God exactly what the Bible says. If you take the Bible at face value, if you read it as literature, you will be a dispensationalist. Whether you have seven dispensations or not, I'm not sure. You'll have at least five, all right? And by the way, the differences in these details about the early dispensations, it's fine. It's fine. We don't have enough data to come to a firm landing, in my view, on these things. That doesn't invalidate the whole method of understanding the Bible as literature, right? You will believe in a local assembly. Absolutely you will if you take the Bible at face value and accept it. You will believe in the pre-millennial return of Christ, the pre-tribulation rapture, a future for Israel, and a young earth. Sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize to you. Don't you apologize to me. We're very firm in our commitment to God and his word. Our method of determining truth, our epistemology, is not through science or the reasoning of men. It is through the revelation of God. It trumps everything else. So that's the importance of having an honest and plain sense interpretation of scripture. Let's think about this a couple of time, for a couple other quick examples. I don't want to take too much time on this, but... Isaiah chapter 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Let's take that expression, the government shall be upon his shoulder. What is government? It's the administration. Who's the his shoulder? Well, it's the child born and the son given. It's the Messiah. The government is going to be upon the shoulders of the Messiah in his kingdom age. That's exactly what is being said. You say, well, how can you put a government on a shoulder? Well, that's clearly metaphorical. Because a government is an abstraction. So you can't pick it up by a handle and put it on somebody's shoulder. This is symbol. This is metaphor. We're not dumb. We understand that this is a way the Bible is communicating to us that he will bear the weight. He will bear the responsibility. He will bear the glory of being the administrator of all things in that coming day. But there is a coming day. There is a government. There is a Messiah. You cannot negotiate those things away. I heard a covenant person speaking on this verse, and he said, God wants to have the government of your life on his shoulders. And I'm saying, that's fine, but where are you getting that from the text? That's a superficial personal view that has nothing to do with what Isaiah was intending when he wrote that for us. Let me give you another example. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass. This is a quotation from Psalm 72. What is the literal meaning? He shall come down. The Lord is going to come down in that day. The remainder of the phrase says, like rain upon the mown grass. Now that's a simile, right? Like or as, you learned that. So we're making a comparison between what is actually happening, the Lord coming down, and another picture that we can understand something about growth and life and beauty. Another example would be, the desert shall bloom as the rose. It's a real desert. And it's going to really bloom. And that bloom will be very similar to your rose bush, which has life and beauty and has a sort of growth that is governed and, and ordered by God. So, you know, I, I, I understand that you know all those things, but you have to understand that something very plain and concrete and definite is being communicated, and the symbols are only there to help us to understand it better. And you cannot take all of the meaning away and conjecture the whole thing. So, just uh, looking over my... Notes here. A couple of other things I might say before I look at my single slide for today. We're going to explore the you know, covenant theology issue a little bit further. One of the main things that dispensational allows, dispensationalism allows you to do is to help you through apparently contradictory scriptures. Scripture never contradicts itself. But if you believe there's only sort of one dispensation, that the, that the covenant of grace covers everything from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you get some issues. I'll explain. Well, let's, let's put, let me give you a couple of examples. Ezra chapter 10. Put away your wives. Put away your foreign wives. 1 Corinthians 7. Don't put them away. Don't make the unbeliever depart. You stay with your unbelieving spouse. 
Ezra 10, throw the unbelieving spouse out. 1 Corinthians 7, keep the unbelieving spouse. What's going on here? Different dispensation. How about this? Kosher food. Read it. Leviticus 11. Then read Mark chapter 7. Read 1 Timothy chapter 3. Read Acts chapter 10 and you'll understand there's no more kosher food. So what, has God changed his mind? No, the dispensation changed. What was appropriate for one age and the way God administered things is no longer appropriate for this age. I'll read you another one. This is the one I have written down here. This is rather startling. It needs to be understood dispensationally. Psalm 137, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them upon the rock. A very tough verse. Now I'm going to read you Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. What's the difference? Different dispensation. There's no other way to reconcile those two very different views of how enemies are to be treated. Today, in the age of grace, we are not to take vengeance. We do not have an earthly theocracy. It is not not a responsibility to execute judgment for God. In other ages, the people of God in that age are his executioners to bring about justice on the earth under his theocracy. This is a very simple point, but if you're not a dispensationalist, you're going to be totally out to lunch. Here's another one. Matthew 10. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What's going on here? That's the same book. Ah, different dispensation. You need to understand and rightly divide the word of truth. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the background of covenant theology. It's not necessarily... We'll look at some right doctrine as we examine this very important... Whoops, the wrong way. Try this way. This is my only slide. I know this print is small. And I know some people are listening to this or will be on tape and they won't have access to the visuals, so I'll try to explain what we have up here. We have here four different views and they're very basic. There's far more that could be said about each one, but I want to just point out a couple of things. I think I can do it this way, right? So this first line up here is what is called post-tribulational premillennialism. I'm sorry for the terminology, but it is what it is, okay? Premillennialism means that Christ is going to come before an age called the millennium, and he is going to set up a kingdom when the millennium comes, but prior to that there will be a period of tribulation. Now this is an incorrect view, number one. By the way, if you want to know which is the correct one, it's the second one down, so you don't stay in suspense, right? I think you know that. This, uh, and, and Brother Ian's going to talk more about the tribulation and about the rapture. I'm not here to so much defend the top one, uh, the second one rather from the top. The second one is called pre-tribulational dispensational premillennialism. This is what the scriptures teach, that the next order of events is the imminent rapture of the church. We do not wait for the tribulation. We wait for his son from heaven. We're not waiting for tribulation. If you're not a pre-tribulation Believer, you're waiting for the tribulation. The Bible nowhere tells believers in this age to wait for the tribulation. We're waiting for his son from heaven, the blessed hope. That's coming next. Then a tribulation of seven years. Two periods of 42 months will follow. Then the second coming of Christ in glory. Then a 1,000 year reign called the millennium. And that will be the the dispensation of the fullness of times, as we've already heard this morning from Ephesians chapter 1. And then the last judgment and the day of God will begin. There's something called post-millennialism here, and you see that on the third slide. And this is where there is a beginning to the millennium, probably, according to the people who believe in this, around 1650 AD. And for a thousand years, the world will get better and better. Even though the apostle said evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, these people say, no, things will get better and better. These are, these are unflinchable optimists. These people can't be shifted off their happy face. They believe everything's getting better. Now, it actually was possible to do that for a while. 
when we began to see the missionary movement in the Philadelphia church, we began to see many people converted throughout the world. And some of the innovations of science were making life better for people. There was more of representative, rep, or at least a monarch, still a monarchical governments, but they were more representative. There was more equality among people. There was not as much taxation without representation as we would say in the US, right? So it appeared things were getting better and better, but they weren't. 1789, the storming of the Bastille. God is thrown out, Lady Liberty is put up in Notre Dame Cathedral. A beginning of atheism and apostasy that has moved through the subsequent years and has led to the godless slaughter of millions and millions of people in the 1900s. And the repression and the slavery and the pain, suffering and displacement of peoples has never been worse. And today, there are more displaced people in this world than there have been since World War II. Things are not getting better and better. We are not in the millennium. You can throw post-millennialism out. There's only a very few people, and they're very deluded, who still believe in this, okay? What rather our covenant friends favor is number four. If post-millennialism is for the optimist, amillennialism is for the pessimist, okay? So there's something for everyone except the truth, which we need to, of course, locate ourselves with. So here's the amillennial position. Now, I immediately have suspicions about any view of anything that begins with the alpha privative A, such as atheism or agnosticism, right? Because you're defining yourself by what you don't believe. And that's strange. Uh, you would rather favor something more positive to promote yourself with, but no, these people are just sure what they're against. They're against what the Bible teaches, a real millennium. So they believe that the millennium is symbolic. It's been going on since the beginning of the Christian era. And we'll go on to the last judgment. It's not a thousand years because a thousand doesn't mean a thousand. We know. We have an inside track. We understand it's symbolic. All right? So this is what most of our, virtually all of our covenant theologians believe, that we are now in the millennium. And of course... The millennium is totally spiritualized. Now, without going into too much more detail, because this is really the subject of Ian's talk later, I'd like to talk a little bit about covenant theology. Interestingly, covenant theology, as I said at the beginning, is not an ancient doctrine. It is relatively new. You may be interested to know that Martin Luther was not a covenant theologian. Neither was Ulrich Zwingli. Neither was Melanchthon, neither was Calvin. They had some beliefs that could be perhaps concordant with it, but the actual statement of what I'm about to present to you was not codified until 1547. In the West, six, excuse me, I'm a century off, 1647 in the Westminster Confession. This view of theology, they worry about us dispensationalists putting a grid on this book. This is the grid of all grids. You can't find this grid in the Bible. It's totally invented by man, and yet it is the way we understand this entire book. And it colors everything that we read in the book. First of all, they say, there was the covenant of redemption. What is the covenant of redemption, and who made the covenant? The covenant of redemption was made between the Father and the Son. When did they make this covenant? In eternity. What is the covenant about? It is about the saving of an, of an elect people. The Father said to the Son, I want you to become incarnate. I want you to go down to the world. I want you to suffer and die for people. And I want you to be their federal head. Then, in return, I will give you the highest place in the universe. I will exalt you. And I will give you a covenant elect people. Now, as I say that, you can hear that there's much truth in that, right? Obviously, God did send the Father, sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And Christ, of course, did those things. And yes, it is God's plan to exalt him and make him very high. So we're totally with that. What we're suspicious of is calling that a covenant when the Bible doesn't call it a covenant. Okay? But it, uh, it, it gets worse, all right? <laughs> the next covenant is the covenant of works. Who made this covenant? God and Adam. Where was it made? In the Garden of Eden. When was it made? Right after creation. 
God said to Adam, do this and you will live. In other words, you obey me positively and you obey me negatively in the sense of don't eat from that tree that I told you about in the middle of the garden and you shall live forever. But if you disobey me, you will break my covenant. Now, this may not sound all that suspicious to you, especially if you're a Schofield Bible aficionado, because Schofield also believes that there's a covenant in the Garden of Eden. I'm not so sure. The word covenant doesn't appear until Genesis 6. The only the first covenant, as far as I'm concerned, is the Noahic covenant. I'd rather go with what the Bible says. Anyway, this agreement was made in the Garden of Eden between man and God. Man broke his side of the covenant, thrown out of the garden. That brings us to the third and final covenant. It's the covenant of grace. Again, we rejoice in grace. We think this is wonderful that God is gracious and that he provided a salvation for us. So we're not against the, that tenet of it. What we're saying is, where is this found in the Bible? That there is a covenant of grace that was made right after the fall that goes all the way to the eternal state and has nothing for the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God, makes no distinction between dispensations, but rather is just a total blending and blurring of the entire Bible history. You need, you need to have some justification to make such a sweeping change from the, the, the straightforward reading of the scriptures. Where is that justification? Well, we made it up, I guess. This is throughout history. God's chief goal in all of this is to bring an elect people to salvation. And in so doing... He is glorified, but the central tenet of this is not the glory of God. Now, what are the dangers of this? First of all, they're taking the Bible and in, in inducing, injecting, projecting covenants into the scriptures that aren't there. That's one problem. The second is they are now minimizing, even dismissing the covenants that are there. So that's obviously wrong. Beyond that, it doesn't take into account what God is doing age after age after age for his own glory. It does not take into account the clear distinctions between the Gentile, the Jew, and the church of God. It does not ultimately lead to the kind of glory for God in the dispensation of the fullness of times that dispensationalism does. So we ask, is the Bible a millennial? Let's find out. You have ten minutes to do this, maybe five. First of all, we ask, is the Old Testament a millennial? That's almost a ridiculous thing to ask, but we'll ask it anyway. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 15. Verse 17, this is after God has passed between the separated portions of the animal sacrifices and the birds which were not separated. And he himself, like a smoking torch and a furnace, went through, showing that he and he alone would be responsible for keeping this covenant to Abraham. Abraham is passive. He's actually sleeping at the beginning of this to show that this is a unilateral covenant. It's all of God. It's all of grace. God says again and again, I will, I will, I will. The Lord made a covenant with Abraham, verse 18, to your descendants I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Canaanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, and so forth. That's one example. We could have gone back to Genesis 12 as well, where God continually says, I will, I will, I will. He's going to give a kingdom to these people, and it's going to be ultimately climaxed in the millennium. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to prove that from Genesis 15, but I just picked that as an example of a unilateral covenant that God made with his people. He is not going to cast off the Jews, and he is not obviously going to take away the kingdom that he has promised from them. Just moving a little bit more quickly, I want to ask the question, was Christ a millennial? I think I'll jump right to this. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, we'll have, of course, the account that Luke gives of the ascension of the Lord Jesus. But before he goes up, he spends these 40 days with his disciples. And it says here, 
Verse number four, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? This is the perfect opportunity. This is the perfect place to teach amillennialism. This is a, the be- a beautiful setup. Will you restore the kingdom to these people who just murdered you, who trampled on you, who rejected you, who said we will not have this man to reign over us? Is it now, not now time to discard them in favor of a new people? What does the Lord say? It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Christ is saying the time will come when the the kingdom will be restored to Israel, but it is not for you to know it now because this is not the dispensation you're operating in. And so we find out that as we read through the New Testament, none of our writers are amillennial. James is not amillennial in Acts 15. Clearly we've already read that Paul is not amillennial. Peter is not amillennial. They're all dispensationalists. So it's a very strange thing, just as I conclude this. We tell, if if we're covenant theologians and we're amillennials, this is what we're saying to the Jewish person who comes to us. You should believe the gospel. He says, why should I believe the gospel? Because Jesus is your Messiah. You say, well, if he's our Messiah, where's the kingdom? If he's our Messiah... Why isn't the desert blooming as a rose? If he's our Messiah, why are we oppressed and afflicted? If he's our Messiah, why hasn't he not come to set up his kingdom? And you, the amillennialists, say, all of that has changed. All of that has been taken away from you, you disobedient people. All of that has been given to us. So the Jew says, that's funny. In the Old Testament, all the curses that were promised came to us. We took those curses. But the same verses that tell of curses tell of blessings. And you're saying that we get all the curses and you get all the blessings? You're saying that the promises God gave to us were broken so that you could enter into these blessings yourselves? I'm not sure I want to believe in your God. Your God who breaks promise, who breaks covenant, who says he has steadfast covenant love with his people, who links steadfast covenant love with each of the covenants, including the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, all linked with God's steadfast, loyal love. You're saying that all of that he has thrown aside because we disobeyed him? Is it not true that in our darkest time of departure, when we were away to Babylon, is it not true that it was at that time that God said, I will give you a new covenant? That I will take the heart of stone and replace it with the throbbing heart of flesh that loves me? Did not God make the greatest promises when we were the most disobedient? He did. I think you, a millennialist, need to rethink your position. And indeed, they do. Because God will never cast away his people. He will never cast away his people. Obviously, today, the God, God is calling Jews out of Judaism into the church. But the correct thing to have said to that Jew was that this is God's plan for you now. But those promises that you just discussed with me, the ones you're worried might be broken or not come to pass, they will come to pass. They will all come to pass. Not one of them will fall. God will bring it about in his time. It is not for you to know the times, but God has them in his purposes. So we need to get this right. We've hit a a large number of things in somewhat... uh, Maybe not just as organized as I would have liked. But if we get this right, we get hermeneutics right, we get Old Testament interpretation right. We get Old Testament interpretation right, we understand Israel aright. We get Israel right, we understand prophecy aright. Everything falls into place. We get it right, God is glorified. We get get it right, the distinction between Israel and the church is maintained. We get it right, and we preserve the integrity of language and of interpretation. We get it right, and the practical benefits of eschatology, of end-time events, are released upon us. And we are those, then, who wait for our Lord, and we wait for the blessed hope when Christ will return. 
So I hope that this kind of overview of a number of topics, the relevance of the topic, the correct way to understand the scriptures, the future for Israel, the folly of the replacement theology, the errors of amillennialism and of, and of covenant theology will have been a useful background and review for you. This afternoon we'll take up the actual truths of, of course, the church and dispensationalism, the future in dispensationalism, and the gospel and dispensationalism. But thank you for your patience. That was a long hour, and it was, in many cases, somewhat technical, so I appreciate your attention very much. <laughs>